for that sign. And you're also a pen driver, so I'm... Uh, morning, and thank you all for coming. Uh, topic of my uh, PhD proposal is uh, environmental influences on the reproductive larval and post settlement biology of the kind of thorn starfish. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce my uh, committee, Morgan, um, Jairo, and Alex Kerr from University of Guam, also adjunct here at the center. So uh, major causes of coral loss are varied geograph geographically. So the most degraded environments are also the places like uh, East Africa, Southeast Asia, and um, the Caribbean are areas with large, with their large human populations. So this reflects the overarching effects of chronic or press disturbances, such as uh, coastal development, um, coastal pollution, siltation and sedimentation caused by um, uh, extractive activities upstream, uh, destructive fishing, overfishing, eutrophication and phase shifts. And also there, there are also um, pulse disturbances and at the global scale, the most pronounced are outbreaks of disease, uh, bleaching of corals caused by increased uh, temperature and pronounced increase in um, storm, high intensity and frequency of storms and pronounced increase in abundance of coral predators. The most notorious among these coral predators is the crown of thorn starfish. Here and after, I'll refer to as HOTS. So the severity and extent of coral loss caused by the outbreaks of crown of thorns in the 60s and 70s generated a lot of concern about the fate of uh, coral reefs. So in 1969, uh, Dr. Richard Cheshire from the University of Guam published an article in Science entitled The Destruction of Pacific Corals by the Sea Star Ecantaster Planky. And he ended with the apocalyptic conclusion that we were witnessing the initial phases of extinction of Madriporian corals in the Pacific. This may be highly sensationalized, but this was uh, useful in bringing the issue of crown of thorns predation into the forefront of public awareness. So since that time, emerging threats uh, resulting from climate change, such as coral bleaching and uh, disease, has been the major focus of research. But at the same time, uh, outbreaks of crown of thorns continue uh, to occur worldwide and remains one of the principal causes of coral mortality in southern Japan, western Pacific, and of course in the Great Barrier Reef. So at many locations, the effects of severe outbreaks of crown of thorns have been far greater than other major disturbances. In Maria, French Polynesia, for example, uh, the coral loss caused by outbreaks of crown of thorns were much higher than cyclones uh, and bleaching. Also in the Great Barrier Reef, uh, percentage of coral loss was also highest in uh, caused by crown of thorns starfish. And also it represents the highest magnitude if you sum all years and all reefs in terms of coral loss. So in a study by, from Ames in last year, uh, it shows that uh, in the past 27 years from 1985 to 2012, there's been a decrease from 28% coral cover to 13.8%. So that represents around 50.7% loss, uh, amounts to 0.53% per year. But in the, so the, 48% of that is attributed to tropical cyclones, 42% from cuts predation, and 10% from coral bleaching. But if we remove cuts predation from the equation, we actually get a net gain of 0.89% per year in coral cover. That's based on these models. So uh, as climate change continues to pose a threat to global biodiversity, it is still important likewise to examine the effect of life history on a very important uh, keystone coral predator such as the crown of thorn starfish. 
So an understanding of the thermal uh, pH and PCO2 uh, tolerance of different history stages of one of the most significant biological disturbances is important. So uh, climate change is uh, predicted to increase temperatures and uh, lower pH. And most importantly, the combined effects of uh, climate change and uh, conical starfish have and other diverse disturbances have been the uh, cost sustained and accelerating declines of coral cover in the Indo-Pacific. So what are the uh, hypothesis on the causes of outbreaks? So I won't discuss all of them, I'll discuss some of them. So the threat of ensuing uh, degradation in coastal fisheries and tourism is a uh, gives us an incentive to control crown of thorn starfish. So however, control measures are, um, although necessary to mitigate the immediate coral loss, it is uh, important to understand the proximal causes of outbreaks in order to have a long-term solution and permanent solutions. So there are basically um, two opposing views. One is a natural causes theory. So postulates that population outbreaks are a natural phenomenon based on the inherently um, high fecundity of crown of thorn starfish. And so their populations are inherently unstable. And so they have uh, propensity, uh, they have this uh, uh, capacity to have uh, increases in their population. So the second, uh, the second view states that outbreaks are due to anthropogenic changes to the environment of the starfish. So one is uh, one of the earliest hypotheses is the predator removal hypothesis. So this uh, this uh, assumes that um, there are high rates of predation on post settlement and adult starfish, and so outbreaks arise as a consequence of a release of predation due to over exploitation of predators. And the next one is the larval starvation hypothesis and terrestrial runoff hypothesis. I will go into uh, more into detail this later, but this is uh, basically um, enhanced uh, food supply of larvae due to uh, runoff from uh, terrestrial runoff. So my project would mostly focus on uh, these two hypotheses, the natural causes hypothesis and larval starvation and terrestrial runoff hypothesis. So cuts populations are typically very patchy in space and time. So the question is, what regulates uh, this? What what regulates cuts populations? So there is widespread agreement among researchers that one must look into the different biological aspects of the life history of uh, crown of thorns to look at their, to know the proximal causes of outbreaks. So any perturbations in recruitment could reduce, uh, could uh, result in uh, large alterations of the populations. So during this planktonic stages, uh, they are mostly influenced by uh, food availability, salinity, temperature, pH, uh, which is still not studied, and predation, and dispersal. The benthic stages are um, influenced by settlement substrate, predation, disease, food, temperature, and their distribution. So for my research, I'll be mainly focusing on the this aspects of the uh, that influence the planktonic stage, the food salinity, temperature, and pH, and also for the benthic stages, I will be looking at temperature, uh, pH, and uh, distribution. So my main objective is to explore variations in the tolerances and vulnerabilities of early life history stages of COTS to variable environmental conditions and establish key limitations in recruitment and population replenishment. So I look at, as I said, I'll be looking at distribution, food, salinity, temperature, and how this affects uh, reproductive potential, fertilization success, larval survival and development, as well as early post-settlement growth. 
So to address the natural causes hypothesis, um, uh, specific objective is to determine the sex ratio and modality of gametogenic state between aggregated and dispersed populations in Guam and the GBR. Next is uh, also to address the terrestrial runoff hypothesis, I will investigate the isolated and synergistic effects of fluctuations in food availability and salinity on larval survival and development. And then to look at uh, more into the future of uh, climate change impacts, uh, evaluate the effect of a different temperature and pH and egg morphology, sperm motility, fertilization success, larval survival development and development rate, and also larval morphology. And fourth, uh, assess the impact of um, near future levels of ocean warming and ocean acidification on the growth rates of early post-settlement juveniles. So for the first chapter, I'll be looking at sex ratio. And so as I've said, the crown of thorns possess uh, special features in its bio biology that allow <coughs> perturbations in populations. Uh, one is that it has very high fecundity and it's related to size, so a 220 cm diameter female can have a, up to 2.5 million eggs, which represents 8% of its total weight. And a 30 centimeter female can have up to 14 million eggs, representing about 14% of its total weight. And at 40 centimeters, uh, 53, can have up to 53 million eggs, which is about a quarter of its total weight. They also have very high fertilization rates. So um, the red lines are uh, from uh, induced spawning experiments in the field. And it shows that even at 16 meters, and if you go further, even up to 100 meters, you still get up to 10% fertilization rates. The yellow lines are from uh, sea urchin. So compare that uh, fertilization rates just at five meters is almost zero. So compared to other echinoderms that have really high fertilization rates at a given uh, sperm concentrations and time of release and also gamete concentration. So they also switch early from feeding on Crustus coralline algae from algae feeding juvenile to coral feeding juvenile. So this is around um, six and 12 months. And after this, you see uh, exponential growth once it switches to coral feeding. And this is, uh, uh, it takes them away, it gives them the um, refuge from predation as they increase in size. And so the adult size is also much larger than other echinoderms compared to the pincushion star pulsita and the linkia. They continue to grow up to three, up to third, fourth. So they are much bigger than other echinoderms. So they are, and they have really long spines. So they can be, they have this refuge from predation. Another feature is that they have really large stomach size. And so, if you look at the size, it's around uh, two to three times bigger than uh, Kulsita. But if you look at the stomach size, it's around eight to nine times bigger than the pink cushion star. So it has really large stomach and it can feed on uh, wide areas of coral reefs at a, a less time. And it has unique morphology. That's prehen it is a soft prehensile body that it can just go into um, different morphologies of corals as well and feed on them. So as I've said, this, those features predispose crown of thorns to inherent, uh, to high to perturbations in population size. Then it would be easy to conceive uh, small changes in distribution or behavior could lead to rapid and pronounced increases in the abundance of crown of thorns. So there's likely um, although fertilization rates are very high, 
they can be uh, limited by uh, water movement and flow conditions, uh, synchronicity of spawning, and proximity of females and males. So there's likely very limited reproductive success, especially fertilization success in low density, non-outbreak populations which are usually dispersed. So the data on sex ratios mostly come from outbreaking populations. There's some evidence that um, um, dispersed populations are more skewed uh, towards males. So, but this hasn't been studied yet. So this the, this could further exacerbate uh, uh, the fertilization rates, and also if the gametogenic state is, diff is uh, multimodal, and spawning will not be synchronized. So it's important to examine um, sex ratios and synchrony of the gametogenic state between aggregated and dispersed populations. So to do this, I'll be collecting specimens around Guam and GBR, uh, at least 30 individuals or more for each population. So determine dispersion and aggregation of populations uh, uh, as much as possible. Uh, run three belt uh, transects and just look at the um, standardized Morisita index just to look at the dispersion and record total diameter, number of arms, and wet weight of the starfish. Then I'll make an incision on the proximal region of the longest arm. And from there, you can visually uh, judge the gametogenic state as ripe, uh, partially spawned or maturing, or spent and immature. So um, the ripe uh, ovaries are larger. That's very spherical. and very yellow lobes and the um, spent ones are uh, really small lobes uh, or lobes are upset. So partially spawned ones or maturing ones have um, the size of the lobes are not uniform. I also validate this uh, histologically. So they will be fixed in 4% uh, phosphate buffered seawater formaldehyde and paraffin embedded. So. Spermatogenic development in the testes is uh, mainly reflected in the thickness of the germinal layer. So it's thinnest before spawning and gradually thickens as spermatogenesis continues uh, after spawning. But there's evidence that shows that this continues all the time. So the males just uh, release and then uh, generate more uh, gametes again. So, um, so this, the germinal layer exhibits the minimum thickness, and as it uh, thickens, uh, so the germinal layer contains the um, spermatogonia, um, spermatocytes, and spermatids. So, and then as soon as it uh, changes into spermatids, they migrate into the um, tubules as a, a spermatozoa. And this time, the germinal layer has reached the uh, maximum thickness. And then the tubule is filled with spermatozoa. And then the germinal layer reaches minimum thickness again, and then liberates the sperm. For ovaries, a uh, gametogenic cycle can be assessed by looking at the size of the oocytes, uh, presence or absence of uh, connective tissue, and also ovulation. So these are immature oocytes. They're smaller, and then they get bigger. Uh, they get full size, and some maybe smaller oocytes are attached on the wall. And then as they get uh, bigger, the connective tissue also becomes thicker. The connective tissue that uh, around the oocytes, and then at this stage, almost all oocytes have reached full size, and then spawning, you see mature oocytes uh, free in the lumen. So spent gonads are readily uh, recognizable. Uh, histologically, uh, by, you can see uh, thick wavy walls and uh, clusters of phagocytic cells in the lumens. And then it goes back to, goes back to uh, immature oocytes. Um, so, so far we collected um, starfish from Lizard Island and three sites on Guam. 
So these three sites were from dispersed populations, one from Lizard Island, uh, the other one's from Hospital Point in Guam and Haputo Point in Guam. So you can see that it's significantly different from uh, expected one-to-one -one ratio. However, aggregated population from two lovers point in Guam had, uh, was not significantly different from one-to-one. -one. So this one had uh, 36 uh, males and 24 females. So. And compared to a lizard island where there's from, uh, we collected out of 78, only two were females. And hospital point out of uh, 81 were males and 12 females. And in Haputo, uh, 48 males and 9 females. So the next chapter, um, although cots have very high fecundity as discussed earlier, fertilization rates and larva survival and development are still highly subject to variations in local environmental conditions. So for the second chapter of my thesis, I'd like to look at the effects of fluctuations in, in food availability and salinity and larval survival and development. So the larval starvation hypothesis uh, is mainly pegged on the idea that high levels of this high levels of larval starvation at normal phytoplankton concentrations or in the absence of phytoplankton blooms. And as you can see, uh, Every, a doubling of chlorophyll concentrations up to three micrograms per liter causes an eightfold increase in the proportion of larvae that complete development. So just as a review, that uh, terrestrial runoff hypothesis was uh, proposed by Birkland in 1982, and it starts with the uh, intensive rains uh, after um, long periods of droughts. And this causes high terrestrial runoff into the, from rivers into the reefs. And this causes um, increase the nutrient levels. Also at the same time, um, studies from the GBR show that um, aside from increasing the levels of chlorophyll, because chlorophyll is 50, less than 50% of uh, chlorophyll is um, the preferred food of POTS larvae. So they're saying that um, during these events, there's a shift in community structure where the cots don't like the small phytoplankton, the picoplankton, which makes up most of chlorophyll most of the time. But during these events, they say that um, there's an increase in the larger size classes of phytoplankton, which are preferred by common corn starfish. And so thus there's increased larval survival. And two to three years after this, that's when we see outbreaks. So that's a terrestrial enough hypothesis, basically. And there's uh, correlative evidence in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, as you can see uh, major floods uh, were uh, followed by outbreaks of waves of outbreaks of crown of thorns. And models also show that if you increase um, the x-axis is uh, chlorophyll concentration, there can be increase in uh, population size of larvae juveniles, adults, and also increase in outbreak frequencies. And there's also some evidence of uh, this in Guam or terrestrial runoff. So surveys in 2003 on the east side uh, facing the Pacific Ocean uh, did not yield to any, no outbreaks were uh, seen during 2003 surveys, but in 2005, um, outbreaks were seen close to the river mouths here. And this coincided, uh, this followed um, typhoons that brought heavy rainfall and high river discharge. And the, the outbreaks followed two to three years. So the typhoons were in um, uh, late in 2001 and in 2002. And also in 2006 and 2007, there's a, it followed uh, typhoons that brought heavy rainfall and high discharge in 2004, in 2004. So outbreaks um, were observed around this area in um, 2006 and 2007. So uh, flood, so we know now that the flood events could potentially increase larval survival. 
but what is what we uh, during these flood events, however, this they coincide with fluctuations in salinity, so salinity also decreases. And increase in larval, there's laboratory experiments show that there's an increase in survival when salinity was lowered from 35 parts per thousand to 30. So I want to look at what are the interacting effects of high chlorophyll concentration and fluctuations in low salinity. And also just look at their tolerances and salinity even at optimal food concentrations. So to do this, I'll be, um, I will attempt to raise larvae in uh, natural concentrations. So they will be uh, induced to spawn semi-spontaneously by injecting uh, one methyl adenine. And we'll be using unfiltered flow through seawater at ambient conditions, 28 degrees at pH at 8.15. And so this, uh, using this uh, larva, larval chrysal, so this, uh, the water just goes around the chrysal and it doesn't give uh, the larvae, uh, doesn't, the larvae don't get stuck in corners. And like, you know, so we could uh, do this in a flow through system. And these experiments, I want to determine the pelagic larval duration of larvae uh, at normal conditions and examine larval development at normal conditions and during flood events. So um, I'll be doing these experiments at the University of Guam Marine Lab. Uh, that's where this location and the star shows where the where they take in water from at the lab. So during this, I'll be using this natural conditions of seawater to raise the larvae, and also in the event of heavy rainfall and high uh, plumes, I'll take that opportunity as well to uh, raise the larvae and see if I get um, increased uh, survival at this and at this natural conditions. So for the lab experiments, I'll be, so food concentration will be uh, determined by different filter sizes. So my uh, fine filtration, which will exclude uh, most of the phytoplankton. So that's a low food concentration. Um, coarse filtration. So filter most of the large phytoplankton. Um, unfiltered, and then the other treatment is uh, enriched. So I'll be adding uh, Gillard's F2 medium to enrich the um, seawater. And I'll be looking at three salinity levels uh, for this experiment, so 35, 30, and 25. And from this, I will look at uh, fertilization success. And that will be scored by if the eggs have this um, fertilization membrane forming them. So this one is not fertilized and this one is fertilized. And I also look at larval development, uh, time to bipinaria, um, early bacillaria, mid bacillaria, and late bacillaria. As well as look at larval survival and also the, just the tolerance of uh, the larvae. So I'll be looking at at optimum uh, food concentrations, I'll be looking at the tolerance of larvae at different salinity levels. I um, expose them uh, 24 hour exposures to different levels of salinity. Although uh, flood events can uh, lower salinity, uh, for example, the kettles goes down to around 7 to 10 and could last for a couple of weeks. So the next chapter, um, so this has been research on the consequence of climate change has mostly focused on reef building corals and fish. So non-coral invertebrates have received uh, less attention. And embryonic and larval stages in marine invertebrates, invertebrates often have strict requirements for survival and development may be highly vulnerable to climate change. So it's therefore essential to investigate what uh, environmental parameters improve recruitment success of a very important um, a keystone predator such as crown of thorns, and if it gives it an unfair adaptive advantage over its coral prey. 
So this information would be critical, not only in determining effects of climate change on early development and survival of uh, COTS, but also in predicting uh, the magnitude of ecological consequences. So um, this uh, table is arranged uh, from high latitude, uh, from northern latitude to southern latitude, so from uh, Japan down to Lord O Island in coral reefs. And the, uh, this shows the metagenic cycle, spawning period, and also when they're most mature from different studies. So the uh, circle shaded with black are the spawning periods for the different, um, for the different locations. So the northern um, pods seem to spawn and become uh, mature around May and August while uh, the southern, south of the equator, it's around November and February, so in Australia and New Caledonia. But in, um, in close to the equator, it seems to be, they seem to be mature all year. So I think one, one of the reasons I'm doing this in Guam or Nautu is that I can get uh, ripe females all throughout the year. So I can do the experiments all throughout the year, supposed to. Um, but in the GBR, maybe in December, in, around December and January. And so this also shows that this latitudinal, latitudinal differences in the spawning periods also indicate that temperature plays an important role in gametogenesis. So optimum temperature is, seems to be around between 27 and 29 degrees. Uh, the uh, highest survival is around 28 degrees. And this is in Hawaii and Okinawa. And this is above the equator. And as you can see, uh, spawning periods are usually when temperatures are highest. And even in uh, places where they don't reach this optimum uh, temperature, they start, uh, maturity starts as uh, soon as the they approach the peak temperatures. Also, same with the south of the equator in the Great Barrier Reef and in New Caledonia. Um, spawning in, is around uh, November to February. Also, when uh, temperatures are at its peak. And in Palau and Guam, where it's close to the equator, and temperature is mostly constant throughout the year. Um, spawning seems to be uh, happening all throughout the year. So temperature has uh, um, also regulates gametogenic cycle. And if uh, they do this to um, prepare the larvae for uh, good conditions for survival. So after gametogenesis, we'll also want to look at um, fertilization and larval success. So. Fertilization in many chitinerms is robust to changes in temperature, even enhanced in some. And this enhancement of fertilization uh, is said to be because of the increased um, sperm swimming speeds, as well as uh, sperm egg collision. And however, low pH retards uh, sperm swimming and motility, resulting in low fertilization rates. So, I will be looking at uh, the interaction of these two factors as well, and will and, uh, attempt to answer this question whether increased temperature can buffer the negative effect of low pH on fertilization. So the, this uh, study showed the pH reduces motility in sperm and also um, fertilization rates. So larval development. Um, Ideal temperature, as I said, is around 28 to 29 degrees Celsius, and complete development has been achieved in the lab between 27 and 30 degrees. Um, so question I want to answer is if temperature and pH levels affect larval developments and survival. So uh, this one is from the sea urchin Trinistus gratilla, and it shows that um, pH and temperature have a um, negative effect on uh, larval development as well as larval morphology. 
And I also, also look at the pelagic larval duration of uh, cot larvae at different temperature levels. So this is important in uh, also looking at how they're dispersed. So um, especially in the Great Barrier uh, Reef, because uh, they go through different um, temperature gradients. I want to look at what their tolerance is for different temperatures and how long they, until they settle at these uh, treatments. For pH and uh, um, temperature experiments, I'll be um, injecting uh, CO2 gas into to achieve a pH of 7.8, 7.6. And so this is controlled by a pH computer here. And the solenoid uh, switches it on and off once the achieved pH, and this is the pH meter. So once the achieved pH is, uh, once I achieve the pH that I uh, desire, um, the solenoid um, switches it off. And so these are the treatments and the temperature treatments, and I'll be doing uh, triplicates for each treatment. So at pH, uh, that's the control and minus 2, uh, minus 0.2 pH, and minus 0.4 pH. And at uh, three temperature levels, at uh, 28 is the control, uh, plus 2 and plus 4. First is I look at um, egg morphology. So I look at the size of the eggs, look at their diameter, compare for uh, this different treatments, as well as shape. So this, uh, this is important in um, uh, determining also if uh, you are getting good gametes for your um, for fertilization and also sphericity and then sperm motility will be judged if it's uh, so progressive is uh, sperm that's moving in a linear direction uh, or non-linear so it's moving but it, the uh, direction is not linear non-progressive it's moving but it's not going anywhere and emoto sperm. So, so far we have uh, this data from uh, previous experiments by acid addition. We got uh, zero um, sperm motility at the age 7.6, but around 98% um, sperm motility at uh, controlled normal pH. I'll also look at uh, fertilization rates, um, larval survival, as well as larval development. And as well as I've said, the thermal tolerance and pelagic larval duration. So the next chapter is um, also look at the effects of ocean warming and acidification on growth rates of early post-settlement juveniles. So I will um, grow them out up to this uh, up early post-settlement stages. Um, so the major driver of decreased growth uh, pH is a major driver of decreased growth rates in heavily calcified marine organisms. However, cots have uh, calcareous ossicles embedded within connected and connected by soft tissue. And instead of this continuous calcified body walls like most asteroids. And so I wanna look at the effect of ocean warming and acidification and species like crown of thorns that are relatively less dependent on calcified shells and skeletons. Like the uh, Spicester, which is closely similar to Cots, shows an increased uh, growth rate at uh, different, um, so temperature and pH increases the growth rate of um, Spicester. So it's the same uh, with cuts that it has these ossicles and it has this soft tissue, unlike other asteroids. So again, I'll be looking at these three uh, pH and three temperature conditions and measure the total diameter of um, uh, post, uh, early post-settlement juveniles. Also look at spine length, uh, at least the 10 longest spines of each one, and also the wet weight. So just compare the growth rates at this different pH and temperature and how these uh, factors interact in, the, uh, in affecting the growth of juveniles. So um, 
my schedule, um, I've done most of the literature review and field surveys will be done in, uh, so for this year and early next year I'll be in Guam doing experiments, uh, sex ratio experiments, fertilization experiments, and larval rearing, mostly until the second and early in the third year. And hopefully submit my thesis in three years. And this are, are I think, um, one of the other uh, literature review has already been part of it as a, so I uh, contributed in the biological section of the review and this has been submitted in Umbar and accepted for publication already. And I also uh, plan to publish uh, the reproductive biology of aggregated uh, and dispersed populations, as well as um, see if uh, this conocords persist at uh, ocean warming and ocean acidification levels, and then look at environmental constraints on survival and development, and then impact of ocean warming and growth classification of juveniles. That's it. I'd like to thank the center, uh, James Cook, University of Guam, for providing a space, and my supervisors, uh, Morgan, Iro, and Alex. So, Beth, Kendra, for accommodation while I'm here in Townsville. My, thank you.